get started. It's so nice to see so many faces. Don't you wish we were all, um, you know, just hanging out, hanging out at that Renaissance Hotel and getting ready to do this pre-conference. Um, we were trying to count backwards how many pre-conferences we've had. And um, you know what, Danielle, I may have you have to go through the AUCD and I'll go back. I think this is our sixth um, pre-conference we've had for AUCD. Oh my gosh, Dina, of course. Now Dina should be doing this, that means, mm -hmm. because there's not anything a whole lot new except to share with you some of the very exciting work. So I'm going to get started. Um, we do want to find out a little bit about you, but my name is Mary Beth Bruder. I am the director of the USED and LEND up here at the University of Connecticut. And I'm also the director of the Early Childhood Personnel Center, which is focused on building a competent and effective workforce for those children under the age of five who have disabilities or are at risk for disability. Um, the purpose of today is to bring you up to date with some of our exciting work. And then at the end, we do need to hear from you about where we go from here. Now, I do want to start out with kind of an explanation of why we're doing this in two hours versus the usual six or seven hours where we get a lot of work done. It's primarily because everybody is at the last ounce of tolerance for long Zoom meetings. Um, I think that most of us have spent our lives on Zoom since March. Um, and, you know, there are days when my butt is so sore because I haven't even had a chance to stand up and move. Um, not to mention the fact that our mind starts wandering because we're looking at a screen as opposed to being able to touch somebody and reach out, give them a hug, or even just, you know, have a good laugh. Um, so our etiquette of Zoom is evolving. Um, I will tell you, and um, actually as a way of just kind of getting to know everybody, we're not going to have time to go through 70 people if they all get on, but I'm going to start telling you some of the things that made us put together um, a list for every meeting that I have, which includes a consortium. I see Renee here, who's on um, our consortium of uh, doctoral students funded by OSEP to uh, become competent and become new faculty in uh, working with children under the age of five with moderate to severe disabilities, all the way to my staff meetings. Because some of the things that have happened to me on Zoom are like, you can't believe it unless you've been watching it. Um, Betsy Howe, you probably remember some of these. For example, I had one meeting where somebody was teaching their cat tricks on camera while we were all trying to work on something very, very serious. Um, I have had people in pajamas on camera. I have had one person who had um, a cat around their neck and she was kind of holding and stroking and the cat kept trying to get away. I've had the realistic issue of a parent trying to calm a child down who's having a meltdown and the poor parent felt that they needed to stay on Zoom instead of just closing down. Um, I have a few other funny stories of what has happened on Zoom for people who don't recognize that we have to pretend we're in a meeting and if the behavior is not accepted, at a meeting that's face-to-face, -face, it shouldn't be accepted on Zoom. So can anybody top that? Can anybody tell me something they've seen on Zoom that's just kind of like over the top? Then maybe it's me who just has the craziest meetings. Mary Beth. I can share one. <laughs> oh, good, Jen. <laughs> Our, we, we had a training the other day and it was apparent that the participant well, we think that the participant did not know that her camera was still on. And so we had a lot of um, inappropriate body shots as she was trying to just, she was clothed, but still it was distracting. Oh, exactly. <laughs> okay. I haven't had any of those. Thank goodness. I can uh, share one. Sharon. Go ahead, Sharon. That was actually really funny. Um, this was early. I think it was even more funny because it was the intense pressure of COVID just happening. And one of the women um, within our CDSAs was on the call. <laughs> and while we were talking, she didn't realize she wasn't on mute. And her husband came in and said, hey, can you shave my neck, please? It's really bothering me. <laughs> like, why someone was doing it? And, and we could see him coming in his neck. And so that was actually became a running joke for the system for quite some time. It's amazing what you can find about shape memes about shaving necks also. Uh, so um, the question is, did she shave ne the neck on camera? <laughs> she did not. I think. Okay, good. 
Okay. Now five people put it in the chat and I was speaking. So I just, I, you know, I made sure I said her name and said, just so you know, <laughs> she quickly muted herself, but we did laugh, I think, for the next hour about it. Periodically through the meeting. Good. And Mary Beth, on behalf of those of us who Hi, have Alice. screwed up online. Hi, dear. <laughs> those of us who have screwed up online, I have to apologize profusely for all the COVID puppies out there because they have not been properly socialized and we don't know what to do. They're just jumping into the screen. So <laughs> at least I'll you're not I'll teaching them tricks. <laughs> Alice, I was feeling the same pressure since I just had my cat up here. So I apologize in advance for showing my cat. He doesn't seem to know the rules just yet. <laughs> well, you know, I think that there's a tolerance level that we probably all have for animals that pop in, children who need you immediately, um, animals that are very quiet and just stay quiet on somebody's lap. I mean, that, that's not a biggie, but at least none of you tried to start doing tricks and like holding things. And <laughs> All right, time for one more. Anybody else have one more? Mary Beth, this is Danielle. I was just going to say, so I'm a single mom, right, with a two-year-old and a five-year-old, and I know that at least one or two folks saw this on a call because with our act early response to COVID-19, we're doing these TA meetings around the country, and during the height of COVID, the kids were at home with me, and so I couldn't be on calls without them around, and my daughter is a nut. Um, she is so spicy, and she just got completely naked during one of the calls in the background here. Put She had a cowboy hat on, and and like I think her underwear and was totally dancing around like taunting whoever I was on a call with and that was pretty funny but I couldn't get off I mean I had to stay on like right 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 right, right 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 anyways I wish I had a picture I uh, well you do right just get that zoom right <laughs> <laughs> I will uh share that that is not just a zoom thing and you know Kate one time I was doing our partners in policy making graduation I had come from ballet with two of my girls and um, the youngest one was about two and a half and um, or maybe three. And I was at a podium speaking and my other daughter started doing the mom, mom, mom. And I'm like doing the great ignore, ignore, ignore. We have these wonderful people here are waiting to get their diplomas. And then she says, finally, I take a breath. She goes, mom, Kate is naked. And I was like, what? And in front of the podium, Kate was not totally like your daughter, not totally naked, but trying to get out of her leotard because it was driving her crazy. But the whole audience, I'm like having this serious conversation about how proud I am of these people. And there's Kate rolling around on the floor getting, uh, yeah. So that's not specific to COVID. That's specific to two to three-year-olds and four-year-olds and five-year-olds. All right, I think we have a, a little larger group. We're gonna get started today. Um, uh, Darla, do you need to start with the polls or do I, can I start with the, um, everything else? You can start with the PowerPoint. The polls will come up over your PowerPoint. Oh, good. Okay, guys. So I just want to go over our agenda real quick. And that means I get to show um, the slides in a second, um, except that I have to share my screen. I always do that. I forget, I do the slides pretending, like thinking everybody can see it, so. All right, now we can go. And I can change my settings. This is what's been happening to my computer today. It really is um, totally zoomed out. All right. So today we have three of us from the ECPC team going to present to you in our two hours. We're going to break it up a little bit and um, we are going to share with you. And if those of you got to open your um, agenda, the purpose is really to give you an overview of where we are, talk a little bit about the competencies. Those of you who have joined us year after year, as I said, some of you can do this presentation, can bring you up to date. But most importantly, number three, we are really, really excited about. We have been supporting the Division for Early Childhood in um, designing, developing, and now we're gonna be implementing new personnel competencies that should, we hope, guide all higher education personnel preparation programs in early childhood special ed. So we're, Peggy is gonna come and share that. Uh, we're then gonna talk to you about some of the things that we have on the website and get some ideas from you all about what we can do. So we broke it down into an overview very quickly of um, where we are, and we'll talk just really briefly about the competencies. I'm gonna keep an eye on the time. Um, and um, 
then we're going to spend, as I said, a little bit more time with a break in between of looking at those new standards and what that has to do with as we build the workforce. We'll talk about the website and how you can use the website. And then we actually have built in more time than this because we're all going to go on fast speed a little. We can make, we'll, we put all of our PowerPoints up on our website. So you don't worry about, because there's definitely PowerPoint slides I'm going to go fast through. They will all be on our website. Most of them have something to do with the, the website. So now um, we want to talk about some some who's here. So tell me how this is going to work. Now, Darla does magic because I can, I can only do one thing at a time. So you should have on your poll and we just want to know who's with us today and please select one that best um, describes who, what role you're in today. And if you please, if you say other, please list it in the chat box. Okay, it looks like we have 31, yep. Okay, so here are the results. Great, great. We have a lot of Part C staff. That's nice. And you said staff, okay, thank you. And then when you look at the other, we have um, state TA provider, we have LEND trainee, we have retired faculty from v VCU and CDC's Act Early Ambassador, um, faculty for the Early Childhood Education Services in Montana, faculty, UC Davis, LEND trainee, and pediatrician. Okay. Okay. And okay, one the more. Next, the next poll. Could you please let us know if you're a Learn the Science Act Early Ambassador? Okay, so it looks like we have two, Mary Beth. Okay, all right. Okay. And I know our Beth Ann is one of them. And then our next question is, are you a family representative? And if you are, are you part of the, you said the land or other, and if other, please list in the chat box. All right, I don't see any responses to that, Mary Beth, so we'll stop that. Okay. Actually, we had one person, and if they could just put in the other, that would be great. Thank you. And then the last one is, um, if you're a faculty member at either a youth center or LEND, do you have input into your early childhood intervention syllabi and programs of study? And if so, please be specific on the syllabi program of study or neither, I'm just faculty at NECI. Okay, so here are the results. Great, good. We hope we have some uh, goodies that you'll be able to use, those who have um, input into syllabus and those who um, also will be doing programs of study. Great. Okay. okay. The questions. Thank you. All right. So I am going to um, go into the rest of the slides. As I told you, we will make these available to you because they have information that you may want to access. So first, uh oh. Darla, do you have to take that off? Because it's not letting me go forward with the slide. Maybe I can just I stopped it sharing it. 
There we there go. We go. All right, so um, this is one of our, uh, we have a couple of different kind of statements that says who we are. Um, and this is working hard for something we don't care about is called stress. How many of us have been under stress? I mean, it's the elephant in the room. Life is not how we want it to be. Life is not going to be how we want it to be um, for a good, good half a year, maybe even a year. So what we wanna do is find those things we love to do because we can put our passion into that. And passion can outweigh stress. For us, that's what ECPC is. We have a purpose with passion. And that's our little tagline now that we put on everything because our purpose is really to enhance the work um, um, <clears throat> um, so that we can actually move and take our personnel and bring them to the next level on. And to start us off, I always like to say, that what we do in early childhood matters long-term. And just to give you some um, examples, uh, here's a little baby who really did not want anything, had a diagnosis of autism, could not look people in the eyes. And um, you know, with a little bit of help, she uh, became a, a, little, a bigger girl. And more importantly, she was lucky enough to be in an inclusive preschool program. And even better, she's now working in an inclusive cafe with her friends. And that's what early intervention can do. We talk about the fact that we remediate disabilities, we hope as early as possible. But what it really does is it sets the expectation that we wanna be in an inclusive world. And we wanna see people not as different because of a disability, but different just because of who they are, that everybody's an individual. Um, I'm putting a plug for this wonderful little cafe in Little Avon, Connecticut. Um, that because of the passion of two parents have really helped the town that it's in change their attitude about the expectations we should have for persons with disabilities, not just that they're working, but they are part of a community. And so early childhood has an opportunity if we prepare our workforce to understand the long-term implications of what we do early for both the child who has been declared eligible for whatever uh, services that we're giving them, the family of that child, but the community. And that's why we want to start things like inclusion early on, acceptance early on, belonging early on. So the Early Childhood Personnel Center also has another theme, which is making sure that we can document outcomes in regard to workforce preparation. And the reason that's so important is because for a long, long, long time, we tended to think people go to a program, no matter what their discipline, they get their degree, they get their licensure or certification, and then they know what to do. And I think one of the things we certainly know is how complicated our field is and how complex the types of interventions that we do are, and how we really have to be able to show that those who we are preparing and also supporting are able to demonstrate outcomes with the children and families they see, but also outcomes in their own learning and competence and abilities. The challenge we have, as you guys know, because you're all in um, a majority of you are in USEDS and also in Part C and 619 and LENS, is we have a variety of different personnel who make up our workforce. And the, really the issue is that each one of us gets trained differently because of our licensure and certification requirements, which is good because we are getting trained to do something under the name of some discipline. But more importantly, these disciplines all have different identities and have different cultures. So some come from a primary uh, field that is affiliated with medical rehabilitation. Um, which is mainly our OTs and PTs, that's how they started, and some did not. Um, some, if not the majority, certify or license birth through death, and really it's the special educators that now have more specialized licensure or certification birth to five, but even in that area, we have found through one of our studies that there's like 20, in one state, there were 28 different certifications. Um, there are multiple certifications across the country. So even though you might have that title because that's your profession, early childhood special ed, you may have very different requirements and you may have different age levels you're working on. Some of us have age levels that are three to eight, which means academics as well as developmentally appropriate. So it's a huge, huge um, world we live in. 
and more importantly, as we prepare our workforce, in order to give them the skills that we feel they need in evidence-based practice, family-centered, how to work in a team, um, you know, sometimes the four-year-old, the four-year degree just doesn't do it. It can't do it. As a personnel prep person, there's just so many credits you can give a student. My speech path students take sometimes 21 credits a semester, and I'm like blown away. Um, but that's how that program is now set up in order to give them as much capacity as they can have. Because remember, they're doing birth through, through lifespan. So we really do have a big challenge in looking at these personnel and figuring out both their pre-service programs and then what we do to support them on the other side. Um, unfortunately, what has happened is sometimes because everybody is trained differently, we think more is better. We don't do that collaboration, but of course not at USETS. That's what we're all built to do, is to collaborate, share, and have teams. The unfortunate thing is because of our funding structure, teaming, which was absolutely, you know, just sacrosanct in everything we did, is not necessarily happening because of the way systems have evolved. So one of the problems we don't want to do is perpetuate this lovely medical model, which evolved into the doctor recently, especially like me when you get old. It's specialist after specialist they'll send you to, and you're the one pulling it together. Well, families who are at their vulnerable point in life with that little itty bitty baby all the way to a preschooler, you know, they don't need that, but that's unfortunately sometimes it happens. So we really want to reform our personnel so that we're looking, I, I'd say we're looking and being smarter about what we do. So when we're looking at our whole field and what the problem is, this is a logic model and it's kind of old, I did it a while ago, but it was to demonstrate how complex developing a, a personnel and building a workforce can be. Because if you just look at the inputs, which we don't have any control over, our, the children and the family we serve are very different on a lot of different, different um, uh, variables. The early childhood interventionists, which I use as a catch-all phrase for birth to five, anybody serving children birth to five, I'm not going up to that age, um, they all come with who they are, what they learn, what they value, uh, as well as where they worked. Because we know that different programs where people are working, I just had a postdoc, one of my LEND students just write to me that she's, um, she's finishing a postdoc, wants another postdoc because, and she identified some of the things she still wants to learn. Now, because in this current postdoc, she's not getting that. So she's, you know, like our LEND students, really bright. She's figuring out, but a lot of people just kind of work in places and don't figure out that this may or may not be best practice. And then look at our states. Uh, every state is different along a variety of things, most importantly culture. And then you look at the activities that people participate in. So, you know, that to me sets up the whole, whole challenge we have that people think that people who are serving children with disabilities early, you know, in the early childhood arena, they just come and they're good. Well, that's not how life works as much as we'd like to be able to snap our fingers. So at ECPC, we developed a simplified way to just look at what we think we need to do for all personnel who are providing services and supports to young children, infants and young children and their families. And actually, if you go to the far right, it's what we're here for. We're trying to improve outcomes for children and families. But we can't do that by just putting bodies in an IFSP or an IEP. We really do need to make sure that we have effective services and supports. And how do we know it's effective? We collect data. Again, something that we're trying to get people to understand that you really can't demonstrate, not just effectiveness, but to me it's ethical ethics. You need to um, demonstrate that you're making a difference every day you're in a child and family's life. And to do that, the easiest way is ethically, not for people to be happy, but to be able to demonstrate what it is that the child's able to do differently or the family's able to do differently. So how do you get those services to be effective? You need to have leaders and practitioners have knowledge and skills that raise the bar and bring them up there. And so we've said this for years and years and years, and what we really have boiled it down to is the fact that our systems have to support our personnel and that you can't just take a person, as I said, out of a four-year degree, put them in a program and assume they're just gonna become, you know, con the competent people we want. Same time, you can't just take PD or in-service um, and you can't just sprinkle a little bit on people. 
or you can't just have people stand up and talk at them. You really need to know where you're going. And we have a body of knowledge, which you're gonna hear about after I stop talking, um, which has suggested now the certain specific standards that people should have in their repertoire. Not that they're gonna get them all at the undergraduate or graduate level, but they're gonna have a lifelong plan to become competent across those very important values and practices that we have. And it's not just one. And that's the problem. Because it's so complex, we tend to just go with, one of my colleagues calls it the flavor of the month. Another person said it's the person who entertains us the most. Another is the person we like the most. There are wonderful, wonderful practices out there and wonderful, wonderful people out there. But there's wonderful, wonderful faculty out there. And what we need to do is really have a structure and a framework. So what we do here is we provide technical assistance to build those systems. And those systems are made up of multiple components. For those who haven't heard me, you need to know that I start off by saying this was not something we dreamed up. This came out of 94-142. Um, my first year teaching was 1976. CSPDs ran most of our programs. It meant that as a practitioner, you knew what your CSPD was able to offer you in a long term. Now we talk, we talk about personalized learning, we talk about lifelong learning, but that's what we did in the 70s and, and 80s because we didn't have a workforce. So these components are just components. It's not the whole system. The whole system is all of these components because you can't just have a terrific pre-service program and then your students go out. The data we have, only two, well, there's more than that, but two really good studies that follow um, our students five years out, each one of them. Um, and guess what? Practices were not being implemented. And the main reason, because the programs they were working in did not use those practices or value those practices. So pre-service only gets you so far. We need to have that in-service, which is ongoing lifelong learning that builds about competencies and teaches self-efficacy. Because if I waited around for everybody to teach me something I needed to know, you know, I'd be pretty incompetent. And what we have to do is build that into our early childhood intervention workforce. Along the way, how do we recruit and retain? Um, and of course, our top, which I'm going to get into later, briefly, is our leadership. And then today we're talking about standards. So we know we need a CSPD because systems last. Here's a system, right? Interacting interdependent group of items or things or principles. This is from um, Mary Merkster. Forming a unified whole. You cannot do one piece of a CSPD without the others. And in fact, to help states, what we did um, is we worked with our colleagues at ECTA and we did the personnel piece of a systems framework. This is only pieces of it because in each quality indicator, there are elements of quality that people actually fill out. In our states that we work with, fill that out as their baseline. Um, however, we did, we're doing a baseline. We've done three so far, just to kind of keep track of where people are going. So what we have done with our CN619 folks and those on, the, um, on this webinar, if you've been part participating with us, I thank you profusely because we took that data to demonstrate again that we have a long way to go. As you look at each one of these, it's not, it's not something that can't be reached. These are things that have been demonstrated in states, not all of them, but for example, state personnel standards aligned. We're gonna talk about alignments. Uh, recruitment and retention, multiple data sources and revised. Um, across disciplines. Sometimes we do really good job for one discipline. Evaluation is something we're really spending a lot of time on this year with states. And then um, having a multi-year plan that, that lasts. So what does our data look like? Not so great, um, but, but, but getting there. So if you can see what's the highest right now is our um, personnel standards. Most states, and that's because states have done a great job, our OTPT speech, um, Matt, they have to match national standards. It's our early childhood special ed, which we're so excited to share with you the standards of how we're gonna bring that up. Evaluation is, is our lowest, unfortunately. Um, but that's why we're, we have room for improvement. And um, we know that that's our marching orders. Um, this gives you an example under higher education, since this group um, is mainly higher education, our LEND programs is, 
you can't read it. I know it's tiny, but we can make, actually it's up on our website, the self-assessment, but the elements of quality under one area of pre-service is there. So it's example, higher ed faculty collaborate and plan with in-service providers to align in-service and pre-service developments. So there's a, con a, a continuum or a continuity, I'd say, in the acquisition of, co of content from knowledge to skills. So that means that we're really helping states and hoping that states will make sure that our higher ed folks talk to our PD folks and our PD folks are not just doing something that they want to do. It's really following these personnel standards that are going to be in OTPT and speech. They are very solid. Early childhood special ed, we now have this opportunity to make it real solid. But as you can see, what's very uh, dark is what's not implemented. A majority of states um, haven't implemented a lot of these specific. So I'm going to uh, point in the middle because this is our recruitment and retention piece that also um, follows up, um, which is IHE programs and curricula for each discipline are coordinated to ensure an adequate number of programs of study are available. How many states have really done that supply and demand? Um, not many from our take on it. And in fact, we're working with some states now that are starting to realize that that's how you make sure you have a workforce and you basically provide incentives at the pre-service level. You can't wait till people are out and sometimes even in high school. Um, so we know that it's, it's necessary. This is the model that we are primarily um, uh, pushing. We've been pushing this for a while to say that we can't train all personnel to do all things, okay? Sometimes our higher ed programs try to pack everything in. We just can't. So we have made a model that where all early childhood personnel should have basic skills for, to serve all infants and young children. And of course that begins with DAP, but it also includes a whole lot of other information to just put together a good early childhood environment for kids and families. The second level is more advanced training and that's various risks. Now everybody, including ourselves, are gonna be traumatized from COVID, some more than others, but some, I'm not trying to make light of it. Many families and kids have trauma. We need to have trauma-informed practitioners, but does that mean I'm gonna be able to put that into my curriculum? Maybe not, maybe enough to make sure the practitioner knows she needs to reach out to get somebody who is really skilled in that when they're working with a family. Um, the same way with a lot of people are, are getting trained in pyramid which is looking at behavior challenges. Again, something that maybe everybody should have, but at least we need to know we have to have our expert who's gonna come in and help us manage our children. And then our specialized training, which is really looking very specifically at those kids who are the kids who are going to be under IDEA. And that's who we want to make sure have the most specialized personnel available to them uh, because that's what they deserve, which means that our specialists um, need to have those two foundation levels and then they need to go beyond and they need to be the ones who can come in and help the early childhood team be able to include this child, include this family in the community and really make sure that this, again, it's not a specialized service in a specialized place. It might be a person with specialized training, but it's to build the competence of that family and child so that they can participate in all other things. So where does ECPC stand? So we have, um, we provide Universal TA website and we have materials, resources, and tools, which you're gonna see at the end. We're gonna walk you through all the things, but we do provide targeted TA. Um, we provide um, things to two, three different populations, one being state staff, uh, second being IHE faculty and students, which is what you're participating in with our partnership with AUCD and families. And our whole focus and, and you know, the reason we are putting families in front of everything now is because for those of us who are old and uh, I'm not gonna call anybody out, but a number of you remember the days when parents were always co-faculty with us. It was just a given. In fact, OSEP, I think required it in a lot of our grants. So we're, getting back on that bandwagon. And it's not a bandwagon. It's basically, that's one of the things we are doing here at um, ECPC, which is training families. But we are hoping in the next two years to match some of the families we've trained and to build state systems where families will be available. They will have gone through a training on not just how to tell their story, but how to help personnel who are both at pre-service and in-service understand the family perspective and match them with state Part C systems 
619 and higher ed programs. So we really are um, looking at making a dent in the next two years. And then our intensive. Um, we are developing state CSPDs, which is intensive. I'll share with you a quick model of what we do. But we're also um, now looking at some very specific components of the CSPD. Um, now that OSEP is kind of building capacity, they want us to really be able to come up with rubrics. And we started with our leadership academy. And our leadership academy is um, focused initially on Part C and 619 coordinators who helped develop um, the curriculum that we're using and how to develop uh, leaders that will sustain. And then we also um, will be working with states on unique and out of the box recruitment and retention, okay? Because one of the things we know is that it is a huge thing. And I know at least Alice is on and some other Part C. Um, we're working with ITCA um, to see if we can even get a count for Part C um, personnel, because as you know, that does not get turned into the feds. So states have various ways that they're counting personnel or not. So we're trying to at least get that baseline of how many people are out there doing Part C. And then standards, which are, as I keep saying, I keep teasing, we're gonna get there. Um, so what do we have? This is the part that you can look away because I'm gonna go through some of these slides real fast without really talking about them because I want you to know they will be on our website. But in knowledge development, which is how do we get information? We then turn it into materials and then we provide TA. This is our list of the kinds of things we have already done. And that's what I have PowerPoints on to share with you. This is gonna be on our website, but we have developed a whole lot of things through think tanks, national surveys, focus groups. Um, and we've turned it into very specific materials and tools and resources for the field to use, which we then disseminate through TA, universal, targeted, and intensive. So I'm gonna just go through some of the things that we have, for example, for pre-service. We have um, a number of things that we've done to gather the information, the specific materials and tools that we have that you can use. And you can see what we wanna make sure people understand is that this doesn't just come from us and our idea. We don't believe in top-down, we believe in participatory. So we've done multiple meetings, getting input. We've then turned it into things. Multiple people, I thank you if you're on here, have given us reviews of our materials. And then we disseminate it through targeted and intensive TA. Um, these are not the kind of programs that we've worked with, um, but we've had a lot of input into higher ed programs, but we're ready to kind of take it the next step. We've done literature syntheses and reviews. That's the other way we gather knowledge is through the literature. We have data reports on all of our input. And for example, we have checklists, for example, metasynthesis that tell us, and we've turned these into checklists so that, for example, this is on in-service. You should not be spending one penny on in-service if it doesn't meet these criteria, because this is from a metasynthesis of effective adult learning, not new stuff, but it's not usually implemented in this systemic way. So we really do want to make sure that we are giving to the field what they need to do to get the outcomes. And these are all prettied up on our website, which you will see. And then, for example, we have checklists such as core elements of TA. Another area, and I'm only going to do this briefly because we're going to get into this after our break with um, Peggy in regard to um, the specific standards, but another area that we focused on is personnel standards. And this is one of the things that I think we, we have to acknowledge, which is how are we supposed to teach them professional skills when they come to us not even knowing basic courses in elementary hexes. I see that all the time in PD. You have a, a group of people that you're going to be providing PD to, and they're all over the board in terms of their baseline. And why wouldn't they be? Because they all come from different personnel prep programs with different orientations. Um, so we really can't do one size fits all. We really do need to individualize an individual based on a person's sense of um, efficacy for themselves. We have for you, if you want, an updated um, map that has every uh, licensing certification in every state for any discipline. Um, we're just updating that. We have, and I saw Tobias here, um, um, interdiscipl an interdisciplinary cross-disciplinary professional work group that has been worked with all of these um, organizations. 
And these organizations took, I think it was almost five years, it was like four years, where we had the organizations participate in coming up with a common set of competencies for those serving children under the age of five. Differentiate, competencies are not enforceable, meaning standards are if you're not gonna get an accredited program, but competencies are guides and they're guides to help people know what they should be able to know and do. And our four areas are here, family-centered, evidence-informed, coordination, collaboration, professionalism. And this got published, that's why this looks so tiny, but this is the, the actual checklists are up on our website. These are the areas that those organizations, back, 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 these organizations all approved at the board level for these four areas. And we're so thrilled that we need to get these out for both in-service and pre-service. Um, we have done alignments, which are on our websites. You'll hear of all personnel standards to make it easy. And that is on our website. So I'm gonna share with you just briefly one more thing, and then it probably is time for us to um, just wind down. We have an, an, our targeted, I'm not gonna go into that, but what we have spent a lot of time on in regard to BEC and AUCD is helping programs, which is why you had that question, create or revise your program and study or still align. And we're gonna give you some more um, opportunities to um, get some help to do that. But more importantly, we spent a lot of time with our intensive TA with state. And what we do is we start with the personnel framework, we do strategic planning, and then we come up with a plan. And we're using implementation science, we've been doing this for 10 years, but basically it's a step-by-step. -step. Because the one thing I do know is the simpler a process, the more apt it is to sustain. And the simpler the process, the easier it is to implement. We do strategic planning with a stakeholder group. We actually have a, um, a manual. It's kind of like uh, the series where you can just follow the line. We really do have fill in the blanks, set it up like this. It's pretty darn easy. But the most important piece is people then have to come up with their plans. And this is the example of um, how people are evaluating because we make sure everybody has evaluation data. Um, and here's another example. And that's just pretty much what we do. So we have done this in about eight states that have sustained pieces of it in about five years ago. And we're now in four states and hope to be working with two more. We have a variety of different tools. We invite you to look at them because our goal is to have these tools be able to be implemented by state staff. And here's our wonderful Hawaii team, which was also, um, the USID was a major part of that thing about other groups is we make sure the use it and the lens are part of it as well as all the other stakeholders who are in the state because their goal is to build this system this system that's not just pd and it's not just higher ed and it's not just recruitment it's got to work together if it's going to go our last thing is our lovely leadership academy which i thank our c and our 619 folks they've come up with a, a rubric of a hierarchy foundational skills, programmatic skills, and transformational skills. And these are the tiers within those skill levels where we are actually having the opportunity now to um, work with a group of, uh, they're our first pilot group of CN619 folks, all of whom helped put this together, um, which is a variety of outside speakers. It's run like an academy, but with Zoom, everything is Zoom. Um, and um, ideally, we'll be together next year. And we're also replicating in the wonderful state of Connecticut. So um, we are actually taking this curriculum and moving it forward. So I have to close with pictures to remind us why we do what we do, because these are just, we have the easiest job, I think, when we work with such cutie patooties. You know, these kids are just so much fun and the families are so wonderful to let us in their homes, let us in their lives and let us help them help their children. So our whole goal in, in TA is really to help states or higher ed systems or any of those components of a, a CSPD figure out where are they, because everything has to start with a baseline, where do you want to go, and then what do you need to do and how do you measure it? Because just like that magic of this is you know, where we're going, it really, to do a good CSPD, it's not magic, it's not flashy, it's not people coming in to make it seem like it's easy, because it's not. Our states are working so hard to get this going, 
our hiring programs are working because we have lost our way a little bit. We have so many programs growing so fast, we forget what our goal is. So looking at the time, you know, I think I've talked way too much um, for you all. I think we're gonna take a break now before I turn it over to Peggy, who's gonna walk us through the very specifics of the new EI, I have to, it comes out of my mouth, I have to stop and think about E-I-E-C-S-E, -E, which is what they're gonna be called um, in regard to standards, personnel standards to guide higher education programs, NPD, we're using, we're hanging our hat on the fact that this is the continuity of competence we want our early childhood special educators to have. So um, with that, I never monitor the chat because I get too distracted. Um, is there anything in the chat that I should um, answer or address? Nothing at this point. Good, okay. Um, and no cats being, uh, being taught any uh, uh, tricks or anything? Not that I saw. No kids taking their clothes off? Did you guys see today somebody from the New Yorker got um, fired because of something he thought was not on Zoom, but it sounded pretty gross, actually. Um, so I would like to suggest that the, when you come back, what we're going to do is walk through these standards and then see how ECPC can help you all implement them, whether it be through universal, getting you information, targeted, actually uh, putting anybody into any of the cohorts we have that are working as a group or even intensive. Um, that is coming in and helping a system build a system so we have sustainability. Um, I have right now 3.51. Um, can we do a nine minute break? And I really ask you to stand up, take a breath or two or three, take some drinks and um, come back exactly at four, okay? right where I wanted to start. Um, it has been incredible partnership with uh, ECPC, DEC, and of course our, our parent organization, the Council for Exceptional Children. Um, you will, today we will talk about the initial practice-based professional preparation standards, early interventionist, early childhood educators. Phew, that's a mouthful, isn't it? We, we can't name things easily here. <laughs> um, but most people are referring to them as the EIECSC standards or the DEC standards. Um, they do find their uh, joint home, uh, both uh, at DEC under the umbrella of CEC that still remains our SPA. If you all are uh, into accreditation lingo, that just means they, uh, they have the license and, uh, and fortunately fund a lot of the work for accreditation with our uh, Accreditation Council for Higher Education that some use. It is birth through age eight. Now that's important for people to um, to know, to share, um, because um, I think that's one of one of the pieces that's a, a bit misunderstood, especially um, when we are not talking about using them within CAPE accreditation, but for professional development and any time that you don't have, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about accreditation just a second or two, it, when you don't have the challenge and parameters um, this absolutely is what the Division for Early Childhood, uh, the Council for Exceptional Children, ECPC, our field needs to be moving towards um, in terms of early interventionist, early childhood special educators, um, uh, birth through AJ, and definitely um, has a lot for us to think about in terms of cross-disciplinary teams as well, especially when we talk about professional development. So what happened, I know we don't uh, have a lot of time, so I just wanna talk again, uh, this partnership between ECPC and DEC um, is for the workforce. The priorities, uh, as you've, you've just heard of ECPC is to assure um, as much as possible that every state has a comprehens comprehensive system of personnel development. Um, I started and spent the first 20 plus years in Kansas and that, that term for us is the term I grew up with professionally, um, but I know it's not a familiar term with a lot of you. It means we all work together to make the good things happen and share our resources and blend and braid. 
Uh, ECPC, DEC priorities about quality, uh, quality workforce, quality products, et cetera. So we're both very dedicated to the development of the workforce. DEC has a priority issues agenda that talks about the workforce as well. So we really see what happened as uh, Mary Beth uh, alluded to as a perfect storm, bringing in the future. There was the, the ECPC, um, the Early Child Personnel Center, uh, starting. DEC was ready to a uh, long time, uh, decades in the making, really say this is a unique field, this is a unique specialization, and we need to talk about the uniqueness of it. So again, think about it for personnel preparation. Think about it for professional development. Some of you are involved in some accreditation. But what I'd ask that over the next half hour is instead of, um, which, which might be tempting because it's a lot of words, um, kind of active listen, if you would, and think about how does this pertain to the, the work that I do, the students that I teach, the families that I interact with, and take some notes for me. Um, because it really um, has its roots in uh, the work that all of us share. So DEC um, is committed, uh, again, to maintaining a competent workforce, um, just as ECPC is, and making sure that the re research guides that ongoing participation in PD and education activities. So it was really aligned with our ethics, as I imagine a lot of you share those same ethics in your uh, home discipline. I always say home discipline because we are home, um, uh, yeah, discipline home. Uh, and we can share many homes, right? I like to think of DEC as a vacation home for some of you and vice versa. So what is the DEC priorities issue? Again, we adequately um, uh, equipped a highly effective workforce means, which makes the partnership with ECPC absolutely critical. Um, so that we can all work together on the things that you see there on the screen. The thing I would um, really point out is we're talking about also attention to dis dispositions, your passion for the field, your belief in um, the importance of early intervention for young children and their and uh, supporting their families to uh, to be uh, as effective as they can um, in supporting their children. It's an attitude. Um, it's driven by ethics, uh, moral obligation to align our work with the best available research. I'm guessing uh, you've uh, talked a bit about that before I came in, but really saying to the field with these standards, um, there is a way to do business and we all need to think about that and, and really align our work towards that. It's about being reflective and if there is an evidence, we're thinking about what we're doing with children and families and we're keeping data, um, we're, we're adhering to fidelity as much as we can, but also as all of you I know are fierce advocates for the challenges that face our field, um, for making sure that laws and regulations and policies um, lead to improved services. So there is a professional piece to the standards as well. Some of you may be wondering, how does this fit with the NAEYC standards or the new early childhood educator standards? Absolutely, um, the early childhood educators and early ch intervention, early childhood special education, we still see a future um, that we need to more clearly define that would include uh, blending, aligning, uh, a lot of different uh, ways to think about the fact that we have a shared foundation, that shared foundation is developmentally appropriate practice, that shared foundation is advancing equity in early childhood, and again, um, being ethical in the work that we do. So there are, um, again at ECPC crosswalks between the NAEYC now ECE standards and the EIECSE standards that you'll see. Um, definitely um, as you in your states think about the two, uh, think about them um, and their similarities, but also think about their differences because there are things that an early intervention, early childhood special education um, focused work um, needs to bring to the table. I know all of you know that, like just, you know, just restate what you know already, right? Um, so they're essential for assuring we have positive outcomes for those we serve. 
that we have a, uh, acknowledged that with our general education counterpoint, which is what um, NAEYC is, our K through three partners are, that we have an integrated field. We share uh, knowledge about child development, about family systems, many things, but there's also a uniqueness to our field of EIECSC that's required for specialization. And that's why we as a field thought it was so important to have our own set of standalone standards. Um, and, and just the uniqueness of this age group, zero to eight, compared to the, the three to 12 um, group, that um, especially working with families, that we needed to carve those things out and, and state them um, pretty powerfully. So we um, are part of the continuum of special education. Um, we These standards go up to grade three, and um, they're definitely, embedded in the notion of cross-disciplinary teaming, cross-disciplinary work, cross-disciplinary partners, uh, with our general education partners being a part of the cross-disciplinary focus. We have elevated focus on respect and recognition of diversity for equity and inclusion of all families um, and, and their children, for um, being individualized, being developmental, age and functionally appropriate, for looking at instruction and intervention from that lens that every child um, deserves the program that's right for that child and that family. We've done an elevated focus on partnership, um, collaboration and team interaction. And absolutely a focus um, and again, another place that ECPC and DEC are aligned and uh, share beliefs in that families are the decision maker and the partners in decision making and definitely a part of the teams that we bring to the work. There are a lot of behaviors uh, mixed up in each of, uh, well, I'll show you the standard and I'll show you the components. And there are so many behaviors and questions uh, or so many behaviors uh, kind of wound together. So the reason why is the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation or CAPE um, has a had a specific uh, protocol as to how we put the standards together. We couldn't have more than seven standards. So you'll see a lot of blending. Now what the work, uh, the partnership work with ECPC is kind of pulling some of those apart. So we'll share some of those resources with you to look at uh, some of those behaviors that are that overlap a little bit. Um, they're definitely all in the same bucket, won't argue that, but it's easier to figure out how to practice if we tear them apart a little bit or pull them apart a little bit. So you'll see some of that work at ECPC. So while you listen again to these standards and components, be thinking about how they provide guidance framework in your setting, whether it's an early learning setting or PD system, uh, LIN program, um, your USED, other professional preparation programs. So the themes are families and uh, I've heard some feedback that there, that diversity and equity um, doesn't uh, uh, shine itself well enough um, within the standards. I would tell you that the theme that's supposed to, uh, there's a, a introduction to the standards that talks about these themes being an assumption of every standard. So I think that's an important part of talking about the standards. And uh, so know that they are embedded in families and diversity and equity and inclusion and collaboration and technology. So standard one is child development and learning. Thought it was critical that we said that um, learning about child development, again, this is where some of our shared um, information with our uh, general ed um, in AUIC and K through three partners come. Every, anyone who works with a child zero to eight needs to know child development and early learning. So if you look at the standard, you'll see that that means um, the impact of different theories and philosophies of early learning and what that impact has on assessment and curriculum and instruction and intervention. We need uh, candidates who know how to uh, uh, um, have knowledge of typical development, the sequence, the variations, the differences, what exceptionalities um, look like, um, and other direct and indirect uh, contextual features that support or constrain a child's development and learning. We need candidates that understand that the factors, uh, these factors, the child, the developmental factors, um, as well as social and cultural and linguistic um, 
uh, and uh, di linguistic diversity are really um, considered when facilitating meaningful learning experiences um, and individualizing like we talked about before. And again, um, all of these standards, um, and I won't repeat it, but we're talking about natural and inclusive environments. So um, when we think about professional development, and I won't stop and do this every time, but having uh, been a part of a technical or a TA system for many years, sometimes our teams um, come to us with very little child development um, when they join the team. So using this in PD as assuming that everybody on your team needs needs to know child development and early learning as well. Um, and if they didn't get it in pre-service, then how do we fill that gap for them um, in professional development? So if we think about the, um, so that's the standard, the components break the standard down even more. So you'll see that for standard one, we hope that the candidates uh, demonstrate uh, understanding of those different theories and their impact on, um, as we said, assessment curriculum and instruction, that candidates can apply, apply normative sequence of early development. They can recognize individual differences. They recognize family, cultural, and linguistic diversity. That's uh, in order to support each development, uh, child's development, and also to understand each child's development. Um, and they understand how to do that within natural and inclusive environments. The candidates also apply uh, biological and environmental factors that uh, impact development, and they use that to plan and implement early intervention um, and instruction. And they demonstrate an understanding of characteristics, etiologies, uh, individual differences across exceptionalities and developmental delays, um, and their potential on um, child development and learning. I, the next piece, and we won't do this, I just want you to be aware that this exists. In the, um, in the standards, we did the standard and then the components, and also each one has a set of supporting explanations. And they just go a little further into the story. And so um, what, what it would look like is uh, what a supporting explanation um, should, uh, should reflect. And so as you kind of look at the screen, you'll see that uh, component 1.4 means that uh, candidates, um, again, uh, can describe those general characteristics. They can, you know, say, hey, that's that's typical for a child who's two or three and, you know, they, they have X amount of tantrums a day and that really isn't something to worry about yet and here's why. And they can have those kind of conversations in teams and with each other. Um, they uh, know the difference, again, between typical development and uh, delay or, or a disability. Um, and they also understand um, that it's not just, uh, it's something that by law and by policy, they need to consider um, as well as the implications of ability ranges um, within intervention and instruction. And that's where we get to the individual part. They need to understand potential etiolo etiologies of developmental delays and disabilities. Uh, they need to understand genetic conditions and prenatal and postnatal circumstances and early um, experiences. And also, um, again, uh, the differences that exist um, given the delay and exceptionality um, and, and how different, uh, again, um, diagnoses and genetic conditions um, may impact the different types or intensity of intervention and instruction to facilitate their development and learning. So each of the components has a supporting explanation. Um, and so I think that it's helpful because sometimes um, when we're having perhaps a conversation about how um, uh, a child who has a diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome, what their program or their IFSP might need to look like or, or their IEP, um, coming back to some of these uh, standards and components and supporting explanations, it's also a way for us all to have a common ground uh, for discussion. So that's another way um, we'd really encourage you to use the standards. The second one is partnering with families. Um, just what it says, we, uh, we are very proud of the fact that it's uh, one, uh, these standards are one of the only sets of standards that pull out partnering with families specifically. 
Um, and also that is the second standard saying that first child development, second families, and those are the critical pieces that should ground people in this work of, of working with uh, young children zero to eight and their families. Um, within that, this standard um, it, uh, can, uh, has as its foundation family systems, developing reciprocal partnerships with families back and forth. Um, we uh, expect candidates to understand that family capacity um, is part of that reciprocal partnership that we learn from them and they learn from us, and that we uh, work to build the family's capacity as they make informed decisions. Um, we also use adult learning strategies because our candidates um, and our, our PD folks realize that um, we are working with adults. We are working with families, um, building on those opportunities to support their child. And so just like we would with any adult, any adult learning situation, we look for those strengths and we foster their competencies and, and confidence um, in supporting their own child's development and learning. So what does that mean? It means the candidates need to uh, know family center practices, family systems. Um, they need to know that families change, uh, their priorities change, their needs change, um, and it might change more often than once every six months or once a year. Um, we know that um, the priorities in family life uh, or the those conversations are only going to come after we work to develop trusting and respectful and culturally responsive affirming partnerships. Um, and again, for that mutual exchange of information, um, really emphasizing to our candidates, this isn't one way um, educating families, it's, it's partnering with families. Education is part of it, <laughs> but not where we end. Um, Candidates communicate clear and comprehensive objective information to families, um, and they advocate for access and equity um, in uh, natural and inclusive uh, environments and help make uh, decisions about the resources and supports needed for that family. They learn again how to apply, apply adult learning strategies, which we know means looking at not only the strengths and the priorities and the concerns of the family, but really what are the family's goals? What are the family's uh, needs and, and wants? Um, and how do we focus on that while supporting the child's uh, development um, and uh, as well as the family's competence and, um, and confidence? So. Definitely that happens from the minute we meet a family to the minute uh, the family transitions out of our program. Standard three is collaboration and teaming. So again, high priority to understanding that um, we are um, working together across our disciplines. This is where um, and, and DEC, you know, along with the other associations, uh, was excited to have the cross-disciplinary competencies, and we I think we see those reflected in this standard, um, assuring again that candidates can model skills and processes of teaming um, that uh, are aligned with with the science of, of teaming and collaborating and communicating that we understand um, equity practices that we um, make sure that we implement transitions that occur across the age span and families. families are a part of that. And uh, as well with that, there are teaming models that will be taught uh, pre-service and again, PD. Um, it's not something, it's something that people can learn. Um, communication skills, uh, appropriate use of technology, how do we do what we're doing right now and make it effective, um, especially during this pandemic. Uh, how do we assure that um, the professionals represent multiple disciplines and roles on those teams? And how do we effectively work with community and partner agencies? Um, the candidates, again, learn a lot of collaborative strategies. Uh, working with other adults, the family, and uh, those that are teaming from other disciplines and other agencies and other organizations. And how do we bring all that debt together to effective uh, service delivery approach? And how, in all of that, do we work together to facilitate a truly individualized plan um, during all of the multiple transitions? And, you know, we're not talking just zero to three and uh, 
the preschool to kindergarten transitions, but from hospital to home and, um, you know, uh, transitions from childcare to, to home. So we're, we're really thinking about how we team together with early care providers, with Head Start, with, um, as well as our own EI and ECSC teams. The four standards is assess assessment processes. And so, um, uh, the assessment processes um, uh, is something that, of course, we're going to assume equity um, guides them and that uh, people are looking also at legal considerations. There are, IDA does guide what our assessment processes should look like. So that would be part of the standard um, that we're choosing developmentally appropriate, uh, linguistically and culturally appropriate tools that we're using evidence-based approaches um, and processes, uh, informal, formal, um, uh, curriculum-based, strengths-based uh, types of assessments, that we do the analysis, we do the interpretation, we document, and we share the information with families and others um, so that uh, together we can have the best instruction and intervention um, and monitoring um, for, the, for the family. So that means the candidates have to know formal and informal assessment, those legal and ethical considerations, culturally appropriate, valid, reliable um, methods that are responsive to children and programs and families and communities, um, that they know how to develop or select the, the right tool for the right reason for the right family, and that they know where, what the evidence-based uh, processes and approaches uh, to doing that um, include. They know the same thing about technology and how to do that with uh, families and other professionals. We want them to analyze and interpret and document and share strength-based information and use that to make decisions, um, to, to continually monitor and update, to make uh, decisions. Even when we're talking about routines-based goals and goals that the family um, have uh, chosen, this all applies and that's what um, the standard is about. And so um, that would lead us into standard five. And standard five has one of those long names we're, we're famous for. It is the standard um, for a curriculum frame, appropriate curriculum frameworks in the planning of meaningful learning experiences. So that means probably a lot of what it says um, that uh, again, developmentally appropriate um, practice. And so, you know, we can't emphasize enough that people understand uh, DAP, uh, how to be uh, responsive uh, to equity but that these affirm the early childhood curriculum frameworks across both developmental and content domains. So we're thinking about uh, supporting universally designed, inclusive natural learning environments. Um, we're uh, focusing on frameworks, uh, curriculum frameworks that provide every child and every family equitable access to high quality learning programs and experiences in inclusive um, and natural environments. And so that means we plan and we do modifications and we do accommodations um, to assure each child has a learning opportunity that meets rigorous learning uh, standards. So um, what that means is the, uh, again, pre-service PD, think about your program. Uh, the people that are candidates or work there um, need to be able to identify and adapt and individualize our curriculum frameworks. Might not be one size fits all, and that's what we hope the standard guides. Um, to plan and facilitate a really meaningful, again, culturally responsive, affirming learning opportunity um, that supports the unique needs of all children and all families. Again, while tying those to the rigorous learning standards that are true for um, others in their peer group. So candidates use their knowledge of the early childhood curriculum framework, the academic content, um, the knowledge. We have uh, require that candidates and those on our teams um, understand the uh, related uh, pedagogy to um, know how to plan and implement a universally designed, developmentally appropriate, challenging learning experience. 
in um, what we also hope is that in individualizing the program that we're promoting children's learning within and across the developmental domains and the content domains. And this is where it's so critical that we work together, right? Uh, cross disciplinary teams, general ed, special ed, this focuses on that. And to assure that, um, again, challenging high quality learning standards are for each and every child. Almost there. Standard six, using responsive and reciprocal interactions, interventions, and instructions. This is about the relation. The, one of the really unique pieces about early childhood is how critical relationships are. The relationship between the parent and the child, the relationship uh, between the uh, providers and the teachers and the family. So this uh, really focuses on some of that work. Um, to make sure that um, we are focusing on these interactions, interventions, and instruction across, again, the developmental domains and the content domains, um, that we intentionally promote children's social emotional competence. We uh, focus on the fact of how critical uh, communication is and play. Um, we, uh, those who designed these standards, uh, really wanted to bring out play. Um, it's been a while since uh, there was a strong emphasis about how our uh, children in this age group learn. So again, as you have those conversations, these standards can support some of that. Um, but really, uh, in assuring equitable access, part of it is assuring that it's developmentally appropriate, which leads us to play and, and supporting social, emotional, and communication. Um, with all of that, you know, using our data to make our decisions and to adapt, to approve, and, and move back and forth, um, you know, uh, as often as needed. Um, again, not when it's time to uh, necessarily do a new meeting, but how do we do that systematically and responsively um, and intentionally? Um, and with fidelity, really trying to emphasize to the field um, that, again, the research that exists, um, we need to assure that it gets to the ground and, and gets used. Um, we, again, in doing this, adult learning strategies with everybody, um, any adult in the environment, um, so that together they can really support the child's learning and development using flexible and embedded instructional um, environmental arrangements, appropriate materials um, to assure uh, the child's um, uh, most successful inclusion, to uh, promote uh, the, uh, and plan and implement function-based in interventions uh, to prevent and address challenging behaviors, to also identify and create multiple opportunities for play skills, um, to engage in those meaningful play experiences independently and with others across contexts. So again, really bringing in the relationship as well between peer-to-peer -peer and uh, peer, peer interactions and how critical they are and we know they are um, to our, our youngest learners. They also, um, we also expect the candidates to use these responsive interventions and instructions and interactions at sufficient uh, intensity to support activities and routines and environments um, so that the child and the family um, have access and participation and engagement in the natural environment and in inclusive settings so that they are a part of what they need and want to be a part of. And also, uh, how do we help our candidates to continually modify again? It's going back to watching your data, watching your research, um, using your research, using your own data to guide your uh, interactions, intervention, and instruction modifications through that um, ongoing um, progress monitoring. Um, and again, across a range of natural inclusive settings. So really that promotion again, and you'll see some of that in the supporting explanations of home to school. How do we, how do we support one another again reciprocally and back and forth to assure the child has the support they need um, across their environments. And finally, um, which uh, not just finally, but perhaps one of the most important pieces is our um, professional and ethical practices. We 
put high focus on a field that acts ethically um, and professionally. And so we want uh, professionals to be engaged in looking at research, research absolutely in adhering to legal um, guidelines and understanding what they are, um, evidence-based practices, to be a part of professional organizations, both locally and regionally and nationally. Um, and internationally um, to take advantage of the professional development, but also the advocacy that occurs within these associations for our own profession, but also for um, the families and children that we serve. Part of being a professional is being reflective and ongoing professional development. We don't leave college and we're finished. Um, and also it may not be just necessarily what we can get you know, in our workplace or, or what we're minimally required for our licensure, but a, a, a hunger for improving our own practices that it goes across our profession. And also um, that leads to disposition. So uh, how do we uh, build and maintain and keep the excitement about a field um, through pre-service and professional development that uses ethical and culturally and responsive uh, practices um, and is concerned about legal policies and also relationships and interactions um, and um, families. So uh, we also promote, again, pre-service and in-service that we're all advocates um, that we, uh, part of our responsibility as a profession is to advocacy for our field, for the families that we serve, for the children that we serve, and to promoting best available quality. So um, in every decision we make uh, individually and as a program, are we using research and are we using evidence-based practices in decision-making? I'm told probably two minutes ago, I only had two minutes. So when you get this PowerPoint, you'll see that there are EI and ECSC field and clinical experience standards. The only thing I'm going to say about that is if you can take a student, please take a student. Um, we absolutely need our EI ECSC students to have the type of experiences that um, they can find um, in, in, your in your agencies and organizations as well. So uh, on your PowerPoint that again, you'll receive, that's where the standards sit in DEC, which you'll get a lot of other information, standards, components, supporting explanations. It probably, we're, it's still under construction. So there's a lot there and what we promise we'll pare it down soon. Thank you, Peggy. And um, as you guys can see, what we're really trying to do is have a framework for early childhood special educators. Um, because that's what the degree people are in, even if they provide specialized instruction in early intervention. <clears throat> and this path would start by meeting these standards in their undergraduate or graduate program, even though it says entry, many graduate programs, take folks in and start, really start them on the path of early intervention, early childhood special ed. And what would then happen is we're hoping to teach our candidates to have a lifelong planning looking at what they feel more competent in versus not competent. <coughs> Excuse me. And doesn't everybody think, uh oh, she's coughing. I'm, I got something caught in my throat. Um, what we're going to do now is actually show you where these standards are and other um, um, resources we have on our website. Darla? <coughs> so Peggy, I'm going to have you stop sharing. Oh, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you see the website? Okay, so this is the ecpcta.org website. And um, what you're gonna see is, um, I'm gonna show you where things are. So this is our main page that actually has, and just keep going straight down, our audiences that we provide um, TA to, our featured products, which is our cross-disciplinary competencies. And you click into these and you actually go into and get more information within each one of these. You can go to a page that actually just has all the um, cross-disciplinary, our CSPD. These are all clickable links. So you can go in and get more information about each one of these. We have our maps here and then um, feedback. So I'm going to go back up to the very top. And this is where you, this is where everything is housed. So resource and tools by audience is where. So if you're a higher ed faculty, you're going to go into this um, 
this page on, on the um, menu and you're going to see that um, this is broken down. So we're, we have our ECPC curriculum modules. This is a link to it, but I'm going to show you another way to get to it also. But then we also have our, our new standards. So if you click on this, it's going to pop down. It's going to show you, and this is, this is a direct link um, to the CEC website where the um, actual standards are housed. And then if you're using the if you're doing course development and you're looking for resources prior to the 2020, the new EIECSC, the information is still here. But please be sure that you're on the right page when you're looking for which standards you're looking for. So when you're looking for the new resources, here's the, here's the, here's the gold on the website. What we've done is it, it says new. This is the ones that were um, just approved in 2020 that Peggy just went over. We have um, adult learning planning tools with examples, and then we have one that's blank, so you can actually use. Then we have our cross disciplinary competencies. We have our case studies for each one of those competencies. We have articles that actually highlight the competencies. We have our crosswalk um, with the CEC and EIECSE with the DEC recommended practices. These are all things that, that you could use in your course development. We have the crosswalk with the EIECSC and the early childhood education standards. Those are the NIEYC standards. We have our curriculum planning tool. I'm gonna to go into this to show you what this looks like. And then hopefully you'll go in here and play with this a little bit. So this actually is a downloadable, it's an Excel sheet. And what you're gonna do is you click into it and then it's going to bring up another screen that actually didn't bring up. So um, here we go. All right, it's not letting me share it right this moment, but you're gonna go into it, you'll click on it. And what it does, it actually aligns the standard. It has the cross-disciplinary competency as the DEC recommended practices. And it's also a place where you can actually add your, um, your state standards. Um, all of our syllabi are listed here. I'm gonna show you where these are also found on the modules. Um, so, and then we have the DEC recommended practices if you just as an as a easy to get to link here. So the other resources here are e-learning and connect resources. These are um, e-learning uh, modules. So we have our e-learning lessons and practice guides. And each one of these is a self-paced um, e-learning lesson that, that can be embedded into course development. Okay, then we have, um, and then the connect modules are also there on the, on the bottom of that page. Then we have some additional grant writing tools that have been developed that people have actually asked for. So this was for the 2020, um, actually the uh, OSEP funded um, grant, yeah, the, those tools. And then, so there's checklists, there's the applications, the checklist, and then there's a planning guide for um, personal preparation grants. And then we also have re uh, resources for remote learning. So these are resources that were put together at, um, during COVID-19 to make sure that people, I mean, it's just another place to get additional resources. So if you're Dorla, looking- Dorla, can you show the curriculum modules? Yep, I think what's important, one. Yep. yeah, is that we took each of the standards and broke it into a module where you can find information mm -hmm. on teaching each of the components with PowerPoint syllabi, activities, and videos. Okay, so you can get to them here through the Easy Piece Curriculum Modules or under the Resource Bank under Modules. So either way, you can get to the same page. So here it is, um, it's standard by standard. You just click on the standard and each standard has, has an overview, topics and PD guides, sample syllabi, multimedia illustrations, learning activities and resources. So when you go into topics and PD guides, you're gonna see that um, it's broken down by component and then what the learners need to be able, uh, should be able to know and do. Okay, so all of these are broken down. So this is this is how the whole entire page is laid out, um, or all, the whole section is laid out. The sample syllabi is is that it is just the sample, but it actually it embeds the standard right inside there. And then we have our multimedia illustrations. So these are specific to each one of the standards, and you can see how that's broken out. It tells you how long the video is, and then the link to view it. We have specific learning activities that can be used for each one of the components, depending on the component that you want to teach. And so you can see how they're all broken out. And these are all drop downs to make it easy for you to, um, to locate. Then our resources actually is, um, has our websites that are specific to the resource. We have learning modules. We have a glossary. 
um, that are used in the standards of components. And then we have our references. And each, like I said, each one is broken up this way. The one that's the most complex is standard six. And this one actually has um, three different syllabi because there was so much embedded into one, um, into one standard. So this one actually has a lot more um, information, but it's broken down based on what you, what you would be using. So we've actually listed the components that are addressed in the syllabi. And that is the um, under resource bank modules, or you can get to it under the higher ed link. And that's it. Um, can you just show where the knowledge, um, the metasyntheses that people may want their students? So all under here is the different reports you can get and um, uh, the literature reviews. Again, your students may want them or to use them or to improve upon them, which would be great. But we really did take a lot of the topics that we need to do. Um, one of the things that I just want to talk about a little bit about uh, pedagogy is that we have focused most of our work on the content of pedagogy, not the methodology. Our next two years will be looking at using e-tools for methodology, because that's again, as, as everybody has been forced to do remote, and I do always say that, remind people that remote is not always our first, chair, uh, first choice, especially when we're thinking of social equity and um, actual intervention equity a lot of the families who we most worry about are not able to access remote in such a way that they can help their children learn. And there's a variety of factors that go into that, but I think we need to acknowledge if in fact we are gonna be doing remote, we need to have a foundation of what that means and what early intervention and early childhood special ed is all about. And we sometimes in the, in, in the hurry to make sure we're doing something for families, we might be forgetting some of the content, which is what we have spent the last two years on. And now we're gonna be looking at the methodology and the models that are out there. Because as you all know, we have a lot of different words that are batted around to describe what early intervention is. And our job with Office of Special Ed Programs is to help clarify um, some of the semantics we use and describe what we're trying to do. Um, and I'll give you my, my favorite example um, because we all know that everybody uses the word coach. I had a class and I said to somebody, she was explaining to me, I said, tell me more what you're doing because I'm trying to just find out with the family. And she goes, I'm coaching. And I said, great, what are you coaching? And she goes, I'm coaching. And I said, for what? And she goes, I'm coaching. That's what early intervention is called. Don't you know that? She said that to me. Now, being as old as I am, I didn't get upset, but I think that that's what's happening is people are going for words, not describing what that means. To me, it means you establish a relationship with a family, you establish a partnership, you have good interactions, and then you're able to work on child um, interventions, which means we use our expertise to help shape the family um, whatever you want to call it, but let's be careful that we know there's content we're doing. We're not just doing a verb. We're actually working on an individual. So that's our next direction is to really see if we can come clarity because again, it's only one, that's only one methodology and content are only one component of building a system to support our personnel. So we really do need to start moving forward. Now we don't have a lot of time. We're not going to go into groups. We've been figuring that out. We would love people to unmute for as long as people want to ask questions. I mean, just at least we know we have about um, 13 minutes left. Get some ideas, get some just reactions, things that you know. I will pass on to you that some of the things in our next year's work plan are to continue to do the Khan Academy for early childhood, which is those short, short vignettes that explain and illustrate. Because one of the things we know to change a person's behavior, you need to be able to see it, sometimes even do it, to be able to experience what we're asking you to do. And whether that's training an early interventionist and how to have a communication back and forth with a parent, or whether it's training an early childhood special educator to set up a peer mediated intervention, which Betsy Howe is my expert on, you know, we really do need to be able to go in and, and show it. So that's one of our tasks. Our second I mentioned is our bringing families back into personnel. That means both at higher ed and in PD, having families partner with us to really share what it means when somebody comes into their home or what it means when their child is going to preschool for the first time. 
Um, and, and we need those authentic voices. And then we're doing one other thing that I have these wonderful graduate students. We are looking at every early childhood special ed program in the country right now and looking at course content. And we're hoping to come up with a rubric of what a blended program should have in it to develop those competencies. We are, as I've said many times, using as the foundation um, and guide uh, our new standards. And how do we help a blended program meet those standards as well as meet the NAEYC standards, which is a lot. And that's what we want to see. We don't, we want to acknowledge that. People think that we can just put people through these programs. No, it's a lot to do it well. So opening up, I see some wonderful faces, questions, reactions, or other things you think we should be focused on. I have a question. Go, Karen. Um, I'm so I'm a physical therapist um, in Wyoming, and um, I'm also a LEND trainee. Good and, for you. And so my leadership group and um, a part of my own personal development goals is getting getting together a model that early intervention early intervention clinicians in rural areas have access to modules, um, mentorship um, programs, um, so they feel more comfortable doing their job as clinicians. My, um, my thing as a physical therapist is I'm trying to build on, build a virtual clinic where parents are actually the ones that are treating their children. So as far as like birth to three, they're handling them, they're progressing their physical development, they're doing um, all of that. But one thing I run into, even you know, as a therapist is how do I teach parents? How do I actually, like what kind of um, material would they respond to as far as, you know, versus in a clinic where I'm most likely doing the hands-on stuff um, now moving online, it almost forces you to, to do teaching. So I don't know if you have any feedback as far as how um, I could go about implementing that. And then as far as um, for my leadership group, how we can go about educating clinicians to also take that role as well. I think that's an absolutely great challenge to take on. And I am not a physical therapist, but I know one of our ECPC consultants is, who so I'm gonna call out in a second. But I think you, you said a couple of things that I think uh, resonates with all of us. And I really like one of them, which is how do we teach parents? Because in our role, we do need to provide the opportunities for families to learn. Some families, it's gonna be direct teaching. Some families, it's gonna be providing the opportunities for them to uh, practice and we reinforce. For some families, they can do it by reading and seeing a model of what you're doing. So the first thing I just want to um, say your group needs to pay attention to, which I'm sure they would, is the individualized nature of early intervention. So that you need to have not just one way fits all, but a range of opportunities for how to engage families in their children's learning. And because PT is such a physical, no pun intended, um, discipline, where you do depend on feeling tone and feeling, um, you know, how a child is, needs to be either, you know, toned up or toned down or sitting. I think it is extremely challenging as it is for our speech pathologists who may not see. And as I say, this is going to be something we do during COVID, but sometimes after. Um, um, where are you, Toby? Toby, can you jump in, please? I knew that that was going to happen. I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, I anticipated that. So, <laughs> hey, hey, Karen, nice to meet you. Um, Hi, I think one of the benefits of this whole pandemic experience has for those in those communities that have had no face to face schooling um, or no face to face early intervention programs, um, the providers have actually had to really learn how to coach, how to not teach a family how to do a strategy or a technique, but really um, uh, develop a relationship with the family in which they self-discover 
what they need to do to help their own child do what they want them to do. Um, and um, that is more and more people have talked about that, that they have been forced to learn how to coach and realizing it is very different than going into the home and showing a technique and watching the family practice it. Right. And the other thing, Toby, you know how I feel about this. You need to define coaching because we have four models, two of which are now going to be empirically tested from what I understand I'm very happy about. But I think that that's one of the issues is define those behaviors you would use with a family mm -hmm. and call it what you want. And if it's under the guise of coaching, go into Kathleen um, Artman Meeker's article where she picks apart the variables of coaching. There's 16 steps and most of the empirical literature has left out most of them. Mm -hmm. So, um, and she's not advocating do 16 steps. She actually has a nice little model. Um, but I think that that's one of the things I encourage you as a lens trainee is to take it that next step. Um, Toby is your expert as being a PT who does early intervention, but I think that one of the challenges is how to develop a community of practice, because that's what I would want to do, is bring all your PTs. In Wyoming, you can do that. I've been lucky enough to work in Wyoming, actually drove around Wyoming to the EI programs. You can do that. And I think that that's one good thing you can start with, is bringing those couple of PTs? How many PTs do you have? Probably not too many. Um, so in my, in my leadership group, there's only me and another therapist, but she's actually in Utah. I'm the only one that's a LEND trainee. Of course, there's other EI right, people. Right. But because the, you know, Wyoming is rural, it is right. hard to, to find um, that kind of thing, which is why I've become kind of passionate and I'm even building my own online like virtual clinics so you can reach more parents, reach more families that way. It's just how do I get, I guess the challenge for me is building a program that is specific to families um, where I am, you know, coaching them from, because um, I've, I've even, you know, when I was in graduate school, I wrote a paper basically looking at whether or not parents know how to progress a child's like ability to sit by themselves and they really do they just don't know that they do and right. so all of right. that stuff is so intuitive and um it's just like encouraging parents to, to trust themselves again because i think that's one thing that's been taken away um, and i think the other the other thing i just want to jump in on is being in early intervention you know it's just not you guys who are learning this it's everybody else on a team who's serving that family Right. So my second thing is besides pulling together, you know, your tribe of PTs who are in early intervention is get in with the early intervention programs because every discipline needs to learn how to deliver early intervention through whatever medium is appropriate for that family. Right. And so, you know, it's not just the PT and right. the assessment piece is probably unique to PT. I'm gonna just see, and Kieran, please join the SIG, the special interest group of AUCD in early intervention because we have our meeting on December 14th from one to three. And this might be one of our topics. Okay. All and right. the, and the um, American Academy of yes. Physical Therapy um, has a, has a spe special interest group dedicated to early intervention. And definitely you should be part of that, Karen. Okay. Yes. That's a great, great group of people. Absolutely. Thank you, Toby, who's a major part of that. Anything else? I can I ask a question too? Sure. Uh, I am first let me tell, I am working as a psych provider, psych nurse, uh, nurse practitioner, DNP, and uh, I'm a UC Davis uh, land trainee. And uh, I, uh, this is uh, beautiful that you, uh, you guys have this website, a lot of uh, information regarding development of uh, faculty and providers. And I just wanted to know, uh, is there any other uh, collaboration we have going on like antenatal um, a website that's a, a, a correspond just like this website because a lot of problems originate uh, during the antenatal time. 
including some of uh, uh, the development disorders. And I think it will be, uh, I don't know, it might be already there. I just might not know because I am a frontline worker. I focus more on the practice side. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any, does anybody here have knowledge or access? Because I think that will have a greater, a greater impact of uh, reducing some of the problems that we encounter. Uh, it will be early preparation uh, to reduce the disabilities, especially the environmental related problems, uh, which is uh, could be the epigenetic uh, related problems that uh, could impact uh, on the children, uh, early intervention children. And uh, uh, if we have like a collaboration or other groups that starts from antenatal onward, and then we have, we work together. And in fact, also second pregnancy uh, in the same population that we take care of, it could be better planned to reduce the disability, especially. Uh, so that will have, I think, have a greater impact to reduce expenses and the disability and the genetic counseling before these things happen, they can plan it. Especially the marijuana has been uh, legalized. Uh, it will cause some of the problems now, uh, in addition to smoking and every, every, everything else, other drugs. So an antenatal part, uh, I would like to know, or I will research more on it myself too, but I was just wondering if we have uh, website just like this, or if we can incorporate in the future, maybe. That's all. Hi. Um, I just want to recommend, um, it's not the same, and it won't be as specific as far as resources, but the Harvard Center on the Developing Child has many, many resources that uh, inform antenatal practice and also um, epigenetic um, phenomenon uh, and specific uh, advice and resources about policymaking to improve um, outcomes for pregnant women you know, for children. And it talks about the social determinants of health, which I think is something you're interested in. So if you want to look at the Harvard Center on the Developing Child, that might be a good, good place to look. Thank you, So That is something for child development. And I'm, I'm noticed we're losing people. So I just want to do a closing because we do have an evaluation. We need you guys to um, please do the evaluation. Um, and it's primarily about the objective of getting to know about ECPC. And you can write on the evaluation any other resources you would like us uh, to start pulling together and some of the research. Thank you, Dr. Howe, um, for putting the uh, reference in there for us. Um, and um, uh, I will get other people any information. I, I see some of the other questions we will do. Um, people are more than welcome if you have personnel questions to stay on or personnel ideas in regard to enhancing the workforce for birth to five. Otherwise, I wanna thank AUCD, um, Danielle and Anna, who have been there with us um, for these many years and thank all of you in LEND programs and AUCD uh, USEDs in particular and then those of you who are visiting us, please know that the usage and lens are your resources. And that's the most important thing for us is to make sure that you partner with your USED. Many of our states have some wonderful things going in. I'm proud our person from Georgia left. I'm proud that Georgia USED um, partnered with their state to uh, get some early childhood uh, programs going. So please, we want our USEDs to be there working with our states um, so we can work together for the workforce. Other comments, anything else? Thank you for the two hours. We gave you a lot of information. We hope you get on our website where all of this information will be including the PowerPoints. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you and um, goodbye. And we'll see you next year, I hope, in person. So let's hope for that. And we'll have the ninth annual uh, AUCD ECPC uh, pre-conference for LEND and you said trainees and faculty. Thank you, guys. Mary Beth, where do we get to the evaluation? I know, I was just looking. It's going to be a link that's going to be sent to you. Perfect.
All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 Sorry. I'm going to stay on for half a second. Are you still there? No, wait. She hung up. Darla, you're still there. Peggy, you're still there. Okay.